Hi, everyone, and welcome to Spotlight with Scientists in School. Today joining me, we have Justine Hudson. She's an Arctic mammal biologist, but she's also known as a professional snot collector. Yep, you heard me correctly. She collects beluga snot for science. She is going to tell us why she's collecting beluga snot, what information can you get, and how you can grow up to be a professional snot collector. She joins us today from Churchill, Manitoba, and I'm going to call this episode Snot for Science. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Spotlight. I'm so excited. I am joined by our Arctic marine biologist, Justine Hudson. Welcome to the show. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> this is very exciting. I was just telling you that I told my niece and nephew that I'm going to interview a snot collector, a professional snot collector, and it has them very excited. So why don't we get started? Um, what were you like as a kid? Did you love science when you were young? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would have said I love science, but I loved being out in nature. Like I was always the kid that wanted to be outside. My mom kind of let me have free reign of the outdoors. I was never home. Like as soon in the summertime, I was always like riding my bike, catching frogs with friends, just like being outside. So I don't know if I would have said I love science as a kid, but I definitely love nature. Now, why did you choose um, Arctic science, like Arctic, uh, Arctic biology? Honestly, I kind of just fell into it. Like it wasn't a choice that I consciously made. Mm -hmm. um, when I was doing my um, undergraduate degree at university, I just happened to um, contact a researcher at the zoo in Winnipeg. And a lot of their research focuses on Arctic marine mammals. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I started my Arctic research um, path, I guess you could say. And I remember going to a conference when I was an undergrad student um, called Arctic Net, and it's an Arctic focused conference. And I remember going there and just like learning so much and that my mind was blown. Like I was like, I need to go to the Arctic. At that point, I had never gone. So I was like, this place sounds amazing. I would love to go visit. The research that all these scientists are getting to do sounds amazing. So that kind of started me on that path. And yeah, I haven't looked back. <laughs> amazing. Now, Oh, the ocean um, in general is fascinating, right? It's so there's something very mystical and fascinating about the ocean. But tell me a little bit about beluga whales. Like what makes them so special to you or what is their behavior like? Oh, where do I even start? So when I got to go up to Churchill for the first time, Churchill's this magical place where you can only get there by um, plane or by train. You can't drive there. I guess you can get there by boat too if you want to go a long distance. Um, <laughs> but yeah, getting there and seeing the belugas up close, they're very curious in Churchill. They'll come right up to your boat and you can tell that they're like wanting to know what you are. Like they're looking at you, trying to figure out like, are, what are you? Like, what are you doing here? You can hear them. Um, echolocating and making all their sounds underwater, which I think is really cool to experience because they're one of the mo most vocal species other than humans. So in hearing them communicate with one another and seeing them like make eye contact with you, it's just such a magical feeling. I mean, I fell in love with them. I will, they'll always be like my first study species and you know, like I just, they're just such an amazing animal. So it sounds like they're very social. Like, very social yeah very social very vocal and very curious you know like right. there's not very many animals that I know of anyways that when you're out in their environment they're going to approach you you know most animals are kind of like skittish and they most likely won't whereas the belugas and Churchill they'll come up to you they want to check you out and see what you're up to right which I think is pretty cool excellent now you call yourself a professional snot collector which is like the best career title I've ever heard. <laughs> what is a day in the life of a snot collector like? Take me through one of your typical days. All right. So when I was doing my master's, I was collecting beluga snot. And so I went up to Churchill, Manitoba. We'd go out on a little, um, a little boat, a little Zodiac, and we'd go out with this snot collector. And it's basically a long pole. It's actually a painter's pole from Home Depot that has a Petri dish on the end of it. And basically what we would do is we'd go out into the Churchill estuary, we'd turn off the engine of our boat and just sit there and wait for the belugas to come to the boat. They'd come to the back of the boat and as they're coming to the surface to exhale, they actually like blow, blow. And that's called blow because that's, <laughs> it's basically them exhaling. And that exhalation is full of water, but it's also full of snot. And I would put the Petri dish over their blowhole as they exhale and collect all that snot on a Petri dish. 
And then, yeah, that was how we collected the samples. And then I'd come back to Winnipeg in the lab here, and I would analyze those samples for hormones, which tells us um, a little bit about the health of the whales. Right, right. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. Um, why not use a drone? That's my first question. Why the pole? Yeah, so a lot of scientists that are also professional snot collectors use drones, but a lot of the whales that they're studying are actually large whales. So you're talking blue whales or humpback whales, which are these really, really large whales, and they can't get that close to them. Whereas in Churchill, we can be right next to a beluga. So we can, you know, just use a pole instead of flying a drone. And because belugas are smaller, their blow is actually smaller in height as well. So where you have a blue whale that has a blow that, you know, can reach a couple meters in height, beluga blow is baby size. Like it's very tiny. So a pole just made it easier to collect. Okay, that's fascinating. Now, what does beluga snot look like, feel like, smell like? What's the color? Can you tell, any, uh, tell me anything about that? So it looks for the most part like water. So when you, if I just showed you a Petri dish, it just looks some, like someone sprayed a hose on it. So like you'd have a couple little drops and then maybe a couple big drops that are pooling in the bottom. There's no color really to it, but there was one day where we got a blow sample and it looked like someone had sneezed on it. So you got like an actual snot, you know, like a thick mucusy snot little pile right in the middle of the petri dish and we actually had never seen that most of the other times it's just been you know water very liquid looking yeah. and that time it was like okay this beluga really did give me a snot sample <laughs> this is actually snot yeah. um but yeah for the most part it's just clear water looking okay. liquid yeah now you're taking it back to the lab and you're analyzing it for what so i'm analyzing it for a hormone called cortisol which is a stress-related hormone so you know, we're all human. We've all been under stress at some point in our life. And when we experience that stress response, we, um, our body produces more cortisol. So the idea was, is that if we measure this cortisol in this sample, we'd be able to tell if the belugas were stressed. Okay. And are belugas stressed? Well, this is going to be <laughs> a long answer. <laughs> the answer is, I don't know. Okay, so that's basically all right. one, one of the biggest issues with snot collection is when we get our sample, not only are the belugas exhaling snot into our sample, but they're actually exhaling water. Mm -hmm. So when they come to the surface and their blowhole is closed, a little bit of water sits on the surface of their blowhole. So when they actually exhale, they're blowing up that water as well. So when I go back to the lab and I analyze that sample for cortisol, if I get a sample that has really low cortisol, I don't know if it's because that animal isn't stressed or if it's because that sample has just been diluted with seawater. So because we weren't able to figure out what proportion of that sample is seawater versus snot, we couldn't really make any um, definitive answers of if the, the whales were stressed or not. So are you saying you don't have defin definitive answers yet that your research is still going to continue? So this project is kind of wrapped up for right now, um, but we're hoping that maybe in the future, once some other scientists kind of, you know, iron out these kinks, because there are a bunch of other researchers all across the world working on snot, because it is such a great way to study whales. It's non-invasive, it's relatively easy to collect, it's cheap to collect, and you can collect a lot of samples. So it's like, has so much potential we just have to figure out this one kink before we're able to use it as like a regular way to study whales okay so if there's young kids out there that want to be a professional snot collector they can join the team and figure a hundred percent if awesome. they have any ideas please let me know <laughs> that's great now this might be a silly question but if i were to blow my nose in a kleenex and you were to take my sample to a lab would you be able to tell if i were stressed i think so yeah yeah i have no doubt i always made the joke in our lab that like i want to take all of our grad students snot samples over the year and see how stressed they are you know with all the grad school stress that we experience just see which which parts of the year are the most stressful for us that would be interesting or you could have yeah. done snot samples pre-covid middle COVID and after exactly. COVID, right? There's yeah. lots, of, lots of studies out there. Now, working in the Arctic, that would be my dream to go there. That's one place I haven't explored very much. What are some of the joys of working in the Arctic and some of the challenges? So 
there's so many joys. Um, going to church, I've only been to Churchill and it's one of my favorite places. Being able to go somewhere where you can see polar bears, belugas, and one of the largest belugas populations in the world. So I'm talking wow. thousands of whales. It's like, it's hard to imagine without being there. So you can see polar bears, belugas, Arctic foxes, caribou. Like there's just, it's like being in a nature documentary. Um, so yeah, there's, I feel like there's very few cons of working in the Arctic, but of course it is more expensive to get there. It's not just like, you know, flying from Winnipeg to Toronto, you're going up North. The, the areas are a little bit more isolated. So it is a little bit more expensive to get there. But I mean, it's such a small, you know, con for all the, the benefits and the joys of working there. Oh, absolutely. I, I would love to go there. Now, you not, you're not only a biologist, um, you also call yourself a science communicator. What does that mean? To me, it's the importance of being able to communicate my science or like the science that I do. You know, a lot of scientists, they do their work, they publish their papers and no one really knows what they're doing. And I think it's so important to share the importance of what we're doing, you know, like it shouldn't just be in our, you know, we just share our work with our colleagues. It should be with everyone. So I talk about snot to anyone who will listen, really. <laughs> <laughs> My friends are all sick of hearing about snot at this point, but Fine. I just think it's important. And another reason is as a kid, I didn't know that you could be a scientist as a job. I know that sounds silly looking back now, but I thought, you know, if you liked science, you had to be a doctor, a pharmacist, a dentist. I thought, I literally thought those were the only options. And it wasn't until I got to university where someone's like, no, you can do research as a job and you can study animals. And I was like, what? Why yeah. isn't everyone doing this? Does everyone know that you can be a yeah. biologist? Because I don't know if everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, and it's so true. Even 30 years ago, it wasn't any different. When I went to school, everyone was in a science program and they most people thought it was doctor, nurse, or pharmacist, or a dentist, exactly. right? So same thing, dentist, yes. Yeah. Um, what yeah. about role models? Did you have role models, Justine, growing up? Oh, it's, I don't know if I did. I mean, I loved like Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. I feel like I'm aging myself a little bit there, but, um, <laughs> but like, I just thought it was so cool what he was doing, like, you know, studying animals in the wild and trying to conserve populations. Um, so I, I don't know if you'd consider that a role model, but that was kind of my first look into someone who does like conservation and research and like outreach as well. So I would say that, um, maybe he was kind of like a role model, but other than that, I don't think so, which is why I do think science communication and, you know, talking to young kids is so important. How about inspiring uh, the next generation of BIPOC scientists? How do we go about doing that? Oh, there's so many different ways to do it, but I think like talking to kids when they're young, you know, like letting them know that there are people that look like you that are doing this work. So you, they see themselves in that, you know, they're able to be like, oh, I met a scientist that does this and they look like I do. That means that I can do it. I think that is like one of the most important things. So yeah, talking yeah. to kids when they're young and like just being, being like uh, approachable and like going out and making an effort of talking to school groups or like I said, anyone who will listen yeah. really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what would be um, your best piece of advice for a young kid who thinks, yeah, I want to do this. I want to go into STEM. I would just say like, continue to be curious and be passionate. I was not a great student as a kid in high school, terrible grades, but I loved science. Like going into university, I knew that that's what I wanted to do never was, you know, the A plus kid, but I have passion and I love research, being curious about the world around you. I think, and I know some parents might disagree with me saying this is more important than grades. <laughs> you need to have passion. You need to have a reason to wake up in the morning and love what you do. So I think you're totally exactly. right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now what's next? What's on the horizon for you? So I'm still studying the whales in Churchill, but I'm just doing it, not collecting snot. We're flying drones now to look at um, photo identification of the population there, trying to see if we can identify the 54,000 whales that come into Churchill um, every year. It's going to be quite a challenge, but that's what I've been up to um, this summer anyways. 
That sounds so exciting. Thank you so much for stopping by. You have inspired, I'm sure, anyone who watches this, a new generation of snot collectors. This has been Woo! amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Justine. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.